Next on KCTS 9, a debate between the candidates for U.S. Senate. Incumbent Democrat Maria Cantwell squares off against Republican challenger Michael Baumgartner. Hear what the candidates say on cutting the deficit, climate change, entitlements, and more. Vote 2012, the U.S. Senate debate is coming up next. Local production and broadcast of this program is made possible by the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Enrique Cerno with KCTS 9. And I'm Kim Abel with the League of Women Voters of Washington. And welcome to the Vote 2012 debate series. KCTS 9 is teaming up with the League of Women Voters to bring you a series of debates in some of the key races and ballot issues this election season. Today's forum is with the candidates for U.S. Senate. We have a live audience, which includes members of the League of Women Voters, as well as supporters and opponents of both candidates. Here quickly are the ground rules. There will be two-minute opening and closing statements. After that, Kim and I will ask all the questions. We will ask each person the same question, and they will have 90 seconds to respond. There will be no rebuttals, but each representative does get three challenge cards to use during the forum to rebut something their opponent stated. They'll have 30 seconds to make their rebuttal, and again, they can make up to three challenges. All questions were developed by the KCTS 9 producers and the League of Women Voters. The order was determined in advance in a random but fair manner. Before our first question, some information about the office. United States Senators are elected every six years. They earn an annual salary of $174,000. You must be at least 30 years old, a citizen of the U.S. for nine years, and a resident of the state you wish to represent to qualify for the job. Specific duties include proposing and enacting federal legislation, approval of presidential appointees such as Supreme Court justices, ratifying treaties, and trying all impeachments. Now, here are the candidates. We ask the audience to hold their applause until we have introduced everyone. In alphabetical order, State Senator Michael Baumgartner, who prefers the Republican Party, and United States Senator Maria Cantwell, who prefers the Democratic Party. Let's give them both a round of applause. We begin now with two-minute opening statements from each candidate. The order of opening statements was determined in advance by coin toss, and we start with Maria Cantwell. Thank you. I want to thank KTCS and the League of Women Voters for this debate tonight. And I want to thank Michael Baumgartner. I look forward for us discussing these issues tonight. You know, this election is about moving our country forward and solving some of our problems. And like many people at home, I was frustrated by the implosion of our economy, the fact that there was a lack of access to capital, and many of the challenges we've faced, including the fact that Congress seems to want to filibuster more than it wants to work in a bipartisan fashion. I decided that I was going to work every single day trying to solve some of our economic issues and address jobs. That means that when I had to cross the aisle and work in a bipartisan fashion, I did so. If it meant standing up as the only person on my side of the aisle, I did that too. Because nothing was going to get in the way of me fighting for Washington values instead of involving partisan bickering, get things done. That's why I helped pass a small business bill that gave access to capital from banks to Owaco to Bellingham to help push capital to small businesses where 75 percent of the new job growth happens. I fought to make sure that conservatives in the Tea Party tried to kill the Export-Import Bank, a key program for manufacturers in our state that helps 80,000 people ship products overseas. I made sure that partisan bickering didn't kill that program. I got down to business and saved it. I worked with Boeing to make sure that we got the tanker deal and got programs at our community colleges to train laid off and unemployed workers. You know, the future of our country lies in those workers, not in dismantling our social network. I will fight to preserve Social Security and Medicare and to keep women's health in place. We're going to have a chance to talk about many issues tonight, but I want to keep our country moving forward. And again, thank you all for watching. Thank you very much, and Mr. Baumgartner. Well, thank you. It's, uh, it's truly a privilege to be here. 
Uh, before I get started, I want to recognize a few special people in the audience. You know, I grew up here in our great state of Washington, the son of two great public educators. Uh, my mother, Dolores, is here, not just Washington State's happiest grandma, but also still its best public kindergarten teacher. And my father, David, who served nearly 40 years as a professor of forestry and natural resource sciences at WSU. And it's because of them I was able to go to WSU, get a degree in economics, and later get a master's degree from Harvard. And they instilled the spirit of service within me that led me to spend a year as a volunteer working with the Jesuits in Mozambique doing social work and teaching children. And it was because of their sense of service that I decided to leave my private sector business career and go to Iraq and Afghanistan as a civilian. Uh, so mom and dad, thanks for being here. And of course, my wonderful wife, Eleanor, who's here with our two children, uh, Conrad and baby Roman. Uh, if you hear any crying in the audience uh, today, don't worry. That's just Roman. He's only one month old, and uh, he's just given his uh, opinion on the state of the economy. Eleanor and I met uh, down in Afghanistan on a counter-narcotics team, and I want you to know she is the smartest and toughest person I know. Eleanor studied genetics at Cambridge. She later became a journalist and was even an ultramarathoner. She once ran 200 miles uh, through the desert. That's like going from Seattle to Portland, but Eleanor did it in the Sahara. Uh, I want you to know that if you vote for me this election, you're getting a two-for-one deal, and she is definitely the better half. Now, the reason we're running for office is we think Washington, D.C. is really broken. It's putting the future of America in jeopardy for our children and for your children as well. We think America needs bipartisan budgets. We think it needs private sector-driven economic growth, and we think it needs to end the war in Afghanistan now and develop a smarter foreign policy in the Middle East. And America also needs Republicans and Democrats to work together. Now, quite often when I say on the campaign trail, people say that's impossible. And I always respond that if Baumgartner can find love in Helmand Province, Afghanistan, all things are possible. So keep right. hope alive. Thank you very much. Let's start with the questions now. Uh, at the end of this year, numerous tax cuts, including the Bush-era tax cuts, are set to expire. And at the same time, $1.2 trillion in across-the-board spending cuts, known as the sequester, are supposed to take effect. The combined impact of these huge spending cuts and the loss of tax breaks is being referred to as the fiscal cliff. What do we need to do to avoid going over this fiscal cliff? And we'll start with Senator, uh, or actually with Mr. Baumgartner. Well, thank you. You know, when I was getting ready for this debate, uh, Slade Gordon told me, he said, Michael, I want you to 20 times say that when Maria Cantwell took office, we had a budget surplus, and now we have a record $16 trillion uh, debt. Now, I'm not going to say it 20 times, but Slade makes a great point, which is that our country has gone the wrong direction in the last 12 years, and there is no greater example than the bipartisan failure, and both parties are responsible, than this impending fiscal cliff. Now, there was an opportunity to balance a budget. In the state Senate, we've passed budgets two years in a row. From a, as a member of the minority, we've had fiscally responsible bipartisan budgets. Senator Cantwell and her colleagues haven't passed a budget in nearly three years. And instead of bringing up real ideas like a vote on the Bull-Simpson agreement, she wants to blame the Tea Party. She wants to blame Republicans instead of talking about real solutions. It is a great danger. And I have to say the first thing that we should do is end the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're spending nearly $10 billion a month fighting a war in an economy that's only worth $15 billion. And instead of this fiscal cliff, uh, I think we should take another look at Bull Simpson. It certainly has some things I don't like in it. It has some things I like in it. But it is far better and a far better statement of a productive America that cares about our future generations than what's gone on in the Senate this year in this continuing uh, uh, deficit problem. All right, Senator Cantwell. Well, thank you. You know, there's a reason that Senator Gordon isn't here today. And that is because I represent the values of Washington State, and I'm going to keep fighting for them. When you look at the policies that my colleague just criticized, really he's talking about the Bush policies, about two wars that weren't paid for, about a tax cut that wasn't paid for, about various things that didn't work as far as our economy. In fact, you can find many Republican economists who say those policies didn't work. We passed a Budget Control Act. That Budget Control Act cut $817 billion, and we now need to come up with another $1.2 trillion. We're going to do that. I personally would go back to Wall Street, who's made record profits off a bailout I didn't support, and I would get more money back from Wall Street. I would also make sure that we ended subsidies to the oil and gas companies who have made record profits as well. We don't need to keep subsidizing those companies when, in fact, we need to move off of foreign oil and on to other sources. I know my colleagues will find it hard to work across the aisle, but I'm committed to doing that. I worked with my colleagues, Claire McCaskill and Jeff Sessions, 
on putting a Budget Control Act and cutting our discretionary spending. This basically would result in $187 billion in saving. If we would have done that two years ago, we would have been in a better place to help with this fiscal cliff. I should point out my uh, opponent here said that he would let us go over the fiscal cliff as we had two years ago if we hadn't cut Medicare and Social Security. Right. I don't want to cut those. Thank you Excuse very me. much. All right. Oh. We have a challenge? Go yeah. ahead. Mr. So I just want us all to take a, a clear listen here. Senator Cantwell just blamed President Bush for these two wars that were put on a credit card. Senator Cantwell voted for both of these wars. Both these wars that were poorly planned didn't have a clear exit strategy. Foreign policy is essential to be, uh, for, the, for the U.S. Senate. It is the Foreign Policy Advisory Board of the country. And I think it's very disingenuous for Senator Cantwell to blame President Bush for the very wars that she voted for. All right. Thank you very much. You I'll want to respond? Go ahead. You have your challenge. You have 30 seconds. The issue is, is that Joe Biden, a great senator and now a great vice president, said if we are going to go to war, we should pay for it. I voted along with him and many of my other colleagues because we can't continue to put our country into debt by not financing those actions. I want to bring our troops home from Afghanistan, as the president did in bringing them home from Iraq. Then we can move our country forward. All right. Thank you very much. A second one. Yeah, so, again, here's a clear point. She just said we can't fight wars we can't pay for. They haven't paid for them. That's why we have $16 trillion in debt. Now, I've proposed something that would help pay for the wars. I've pr proposed a one-penny tax on gasoline that would be temporary at a time when we had over 1,000 troops in an imminently hostile conflict zone. That's paying for a war. That's taking care of our veterans. Senator Cantwell has not even done what she said needs to be done. All right. We're going to move on then? I'll, I'll just, let's, we'll get all our challenges out of the way <laughs> up front, and then we'll go back to our other. Listen, this is so important for us to make sure that uh, – you know, we have a lot to finance moving forward. Our infrastructure, as we can see, because it creates jobs, um, improving our airports, because it improves our infrastructure and creates jobs. But we have to make sure that we're doing things in real dollars. So I don't support taxing transportation for something other than transportation. All right. Just uh, as a heads up, both of you have used two challenges. You have one left. All, All right. right. We'll start um, um, with something that we've already been talking about, Vice President Joe Biden said in Thursday night's debate, our troops are leaving Afghanistan in 2014, period. Congressman Paul Ryan said the Romney-Ryan plan hopes to leave in 2014, but would not set an absolute deadline. What is your position on ending the war in Afghanistan, Senator Well, Campbell? I certainly support President Obama and Vice President Biden in saying that we need to get our troops home from Afghanistan. In fact, in 2010, I supported a measure saying, let's make sure that we have a plan, <clears throat> excuse me, a plan to do so. I want to make sure that these troops return here to the United States and we take the Iraq, the Afghanistan army, and they stand up for the security. Last night, the vice president was clear. He said, why have our people there taking charge of security? Make sure the Afghan government takes responsibility for the security. I do, though, in the long run, want to make sure that the world community and everyone support the number of great advances that have happened in Afghanistan, the education of women, the broad education of the general public. When I think about this horrible situation that happened to this young girl, Malala, in Pakistan, the United States needs to work with our partners to make sure we're supporting the advancement of those people. And Mr. Bob Gardner. Yeah, you know, what's interesting, uh, you know, I'm not here to debate uh, Senator, Bi or Senator Bi or Vice President Biden or, uh, Vice, uh, or uh, Congressman Ryan, and I thought there was something lacking from both of them in that foreign policy discussion. You know, two days ago, I missed my wife and I's anniversary because I was down in Fort Polk, Louisiana, advising a brigade combat team about to deploy uh, to Afghanistan. It's interesting. That brigade combat team I advised is supposed to be in Afghanistan in 2014. And the other parts of the discussion we were having is how uh, we are making comments right now to the Pakistanis that we will have troops in Afghanistan after 2014. So I think any of you that think the current plan does, does, isn't going to have troops in Afghanistan after 2014 needs to revisit the Vietnam era and think about military advisors and the things that were said there. Now, our interest in Afghanistan is not trying to build a democracy. The Soviets were only there for nine years. In the 10th year of that war, Senator Cantwell thought we should have 100,000 troops on the ground trying to force a democracy in this very remote and troubled country. Our interest there is denying operational training space to transnational terrorists. We can do that by ending the war now, bringing the troops home, and treating the situation much more similar to how we treat Somalia and Yemen. 
We have a foreign policy disaster right now in the Middle East. We're not credible, we can't afford it, and it's unconstitutional. And despite whatever letters Senator Cantwell points to, the facts of the matter are she's consistently voted to fund that war, she voted to authorize the war. Senator Cantwell has been consistently in support of poorly planned wars that are bankrupting this country and putting a tremendous, a tremendous strain on our troops. All right, thank you. All right, we move on. It has been two years since Congress passed and the president signed the Affordable Health Care Act. The Supreme Court recently upheld some of the act's key provisions, many of which will take effect in 2014. Yet still, efforts continue in Congress to repeal the act. Where do you stand? What more needs to be done to improve health care in the U.S.? And if you would repeal the act, what would you put in its place? And we'll start with Mr. Baumgarten. Sure. You know, I'm, my family has been very blessed when it's come to health care. Uh, I'm one of three boys, and both of my brothers have had cancer and come through it. And every time I make a health care vote, I think about the quality health care we've had and how important it is to get everybody quality, accessible, affordable health care. And I believe that Senator Cantwell wants that as well. We have a different view on how to do that. You know, I have a friend who is about my age. He's employed, sort of self-employed, uh, but he doesn't have health care insurance, but he elects to buy Husky season football tickets. Now, I think that's unfortunate for a number of reasons, not least which I'm a coob. But Senator Cantwell looks at that situation and says, we need to tax him to force him to buy health care, because if he goes to the emergency room, it's going to cost us all. I look at the situation and said, we need to develop market forces to get him a product that he can afford. So the ideas that I want to fight for, whether they're under the banner of uh, Obamacare or not, or whether it's politically possible to overturn that, is things like being able to buy insurance across state lines or having real tort reform that can bring down the cost of health care. Uh, I think we should have health savings accounts so that when he tries to develop some of his savings in terms of health care, he can flip that into a savings plan. And most importantly, health care right now isn't portable. A lot of times people have it with an employer because there's a tax advantage, and then if they lose their job, they lose their health care. So we need to make health care portable. Those are the ideas I'm going to fight for regardless of whether uh, Obamacare is overturned or not. All right. Senator Cantwell. You know, this notion of buying uh, insurance across state lines is something we debated heavily in the United States Senate. In fact, my colleague from Wyoming offered it. And I never saw so many letters opposed to it by organizations in Washington state. Business organizations, medical organizations, healthcare people from Spokane, everybody who was concerned. Because if you think about it, if you're concerned, like those in the Juvenile Diabetes Association, if you're concerned about what's covered under pre existing conditions, this notion of, of passing legislation that just lets you go across the aisle and you're not guaranteed any benefits was a big concern. And so business, labor, healthcare, individual organizations opposed it. What I worked so hard in the Affordable Care Act to do is what our Washington values are, which is to drive down the cost of health care. It should be more like the rate of inflation instead of the 8, 9, 10 percent it was. So I passed new landmark legislation based on what we've done here in Washington State, that is to take away fee for service and instead focus on outcomes. People might not understand, but we in Washington State deliver Medicare services at a lower cost, but actually deliver better outcomes. In fact, my provision in this bill, said by the CBO, is one of the best cost-saving benefits of this entire plan. We have to drive health care costs down, not deny people benefits. All right. Thank you. Very much. I've got a challenge here. Go ahead. <clears throat> yeah, I think one of the real unfortunate things about health care policies that Senator Cantwell supported was the complete lack of bipartisanship in the approach. When America does big things in government, we do them together. You think about civil rights legislation in the 60s, or welfare reform under Bill Clinton, Republicans and Democrats working together. Senator Cantwell elected to be hyperpartisan, and she regularly blames the Tea Party for not being able to get anything done. I can think of no better statement to say why Senator Cantwell shouldn't go back to the Senate. If she can't work with the Tea Party, they're not going away, regardless of what you think about them. Right. And so Thank I wouldn't you. apply for the Senate Thank if I couldn't much. work with Senator Pelo or, uh, Congresswoman you. Pelosi or Senator Reid. All right. We got well, your last challenge. Here we go. The Tea Party, which you've signed pledges for, are not the values of Washington State. I go to the United States Senate to hold up the values of this Washington, not the other Washington. And when it comes to health care, our state has been so innovative whether it's the, what's been done at Virginia Mason or some of the things that have been done in Spokane or just the notion that we should have community-based care instead of nursing home care. I want to make sure that these things that drive down costs and deliver better care become the law of the land. All right. 
Okay, we'll move on to a new topic. Earlier this year, President Obama issued an executive order basically ordering the Department of Homeland Security not to deport illegal immigrants to, who were brought to this country as children. It's the spirit of the so-called DREAM Act, which has stalled in Congress. First, tell us where you stand on the DREAM Act. Then, explain how you view current immigration policies and how you think they should or should not be changed. Senator Cantwell. Well, I support the DREAM Act. I really believe that if somebody has gone through our entire school system, can you imagine going to kindergarten, getting a scholarship and going on to college only to find out that you can't go to college in the United States because even though you thought you had uh, scholarship support, you don't have a social security number, it shouldn't be a fault of any of these children that they can't continue their education. I supported comprehensive immigration reform. Our agriculture community in central Washington is counting on it. Our high-tech companies are counting on it. So much of our economy is counting on us, not just training and skilling a workforce, but also still being willing to bring the best and brightest to the United States. That's why I want to make sure that with Lindsey Graham and Chuck Schumer, we get back to the business. Those are the bipartisan individuals who've been working on a proposal that we couldn't get to because the partisan bickering in Washington, D.C. was so strong and the conservative elements of the Republican Party didn't want to bring it up. It's costing us millions in the products that we have to pick and ship overseas because we don't get a workforce. We have to solve this problem, and just like the bill that passed out of the Senate before, we're going to pass it again and make sure this time a House of Representatives gets the job done. And Mr. Baumgartner. <clears throat> well, once again, you know, we have 12 years record of failure. This is something that absolutely has to be addressed for humanitarian reasons, for economic reasons, for national security reasons. You know, it's somebody else's fault. You know, I think it's very unfortunate the president elected to do it this way. And I had a lot of concern of the growth of the imperial presidency under President Bush. And I think we all should. And it's gone to a new level under President Obama. You know, the issue with uh, immigration reform is it needs to be sequenced correctly. It needs to be sequenced correctly. And if we don't solve the system in terms of having secure borders, greatly expanding the number and efficiency of our guest worker visas, uh, we're not going to solve the problem uh, in a sustainable way. So we have to put that in place before we do something like the DREAM Act. It has to happen first. But if we take a step back on this very important issue and think about what's the fundamental problem here, well, why does our country need to import so much labor, especially at a time of dramatic uh, unemployment? You know, this is an indictment of our higher education system that we can't get enough STEM degrees here, and that needs to be supported as part of the immigration system. And if you think about record unemployment in the state of Washington and jobs going unfulfilled that pay $18 an hour, you know, that can, is also an indictment of our system of welfare reform here, uh, of welfare and labor laws here in this country. So we have to look at this a holistic way. It has to be solved. It's not going to get solved by playing politics in an election year and trying to use it as a wedge issue. Let's expand the number of visas, secure the borders, and do the right thing humanely for all these immigrants. Thanks. All right, thank you. Let's talk about climate change. Uh, a vast majority of scientists now agree that climate change is happening, and people in our region are feeling the effects in terms of agricultural droughts and rising sea levels, just to name a couple of problems here. What is your understanding of our national strategy to address climate change, and what do you think the federal government's top priority should be in this regard? And uh, Mr. Baumgartner. Well, I think it's very clear that uh, climate change is happening. You know, I think the Berkeley study was important for that. But I don't agree with the idea that uh, every scientist thinks it's, it's man-caused. I think that's still uh, debatable. Either way, we need to have a national strategy to deal with that because the Earth is getting warmer. Uh, the best efficiency and return we're going to get is to do things to uh, improve our seawalls and our infrastructure to make sure, that, make sure that if sea levels rise that we're prepared to deal with that. But if we're going to have a strategy to get carbon out of the atmosphere for this global issue, it really needs to be directed towards India and China because those are the main producers of carbon right now. Here in the state Senate, I voted to shut down our state's only coal, coal producing uh, uh, coal plant uh, because I thought I'd like to have clean air here. I like less carbon in the atmosphere and that stuff's going to California. But it has to be done in a balanced and thoughtful way. As we continue to deal with climate change, regardless if you think it's man mized or not, it's going to be on the mitigation, I think, is where we're going to get the highest return and do the least damage to our economy. All right. Senator Cantwell. Well, thank you for that question. You know, I worked in a bipartisan fashion with my colleague Susan Collins on two different pieces of legislation that we have tried to push. One, to say that we must have adaptation 
you know, when there is one degree temperature change, it means something for our hydro system. It means an impact for what we're going to see in prices in the future. And so we need to plan. We need to diversify. And I worked with Susan Collins on doing something that was much more comprehensive. And so this is an important issue for us. I want us to diversify off of fossil fuels. The level of CO2 and the damage that it causes is a problem. I don't want to drill off the coast of Washington, and I don't want to drill in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge, two things I think my opponent supports. The reason is this. We need to start a process to protect consumers in the future, not just from these environmental impacts, but from the high price and cost of fossil fuel moving forward. I'm confident that an energy economy of clean energy can help us create jobs, diversify, and protect our environment over the long run. Great. All right, then. Corporations are people. Money is speech. And Citizens United has opened the floodgates of virtually unlimited money in politics. So-called super PACs are now spending millions, much of it from undisclosed sources, to influence voters in state and federal races. What do you think is the proper role of corporations in American elections? And if elected or re-elected, would you support legislation requiring full disclosure of all political expenditures and funding sources? Senator Cantwell. Yes, I certainly support making sure that we have transparency and went to the United States Senate supporting McCain-Feingold. So it was very frustrating that only parts of that have been implemented. And then this particular element of large organizations coming in and being able to spend money without us being able to identify them. So would I like us to pass even better, more comprehensive campaign finance reform laws? I would. But at a minimum, we need to make sure that we correct this process of what's happening in this election, that we don't know who these individuals are. So the fact that free speech is protected, and I want it to be protected under our Constitution, as we move forward in dealing with campaign finance reform, this is going to have to be one of the key cornerstones of it. But I was so proud to get to the United States Senate, and my colleagues, McCain and Feingold, said that because of the way I ran my race in 2000, that I helped convince people to support moving forward on campaign finance reform. Mr. Baumgartner. Well, it's interesting to hear someone who ran the race the way she did in 2000, the way that was financed, talk about uh, campaign finance reform. You know, I think uh, money in politics causes a big problem. You know, obviously, I'm a tremendous, at a tremendous disadvantage financially uh, in this race, and it's made it very, very difficult for us to get the truth out and talk about our solutions and ideas. You know, if I could wave a magic wand, you know, it would be there would be no television advertising. And instead of doing what Senator Cantwell's done, which was run from debate from debate, we'd actually go around barnstorming around the state and actually have a real discussion and ideas. And uh, I think that would be a, a lot better uh, process to get people elected. Obviously, there's a free speech consideration that's going to prevent doing that. I absolutely support greater transparency and full disclosure in terms of how we finance campaigns because our American Republic is so special, but if you devalue and corrupt the process by which people are elected and play games with how you finance uh, campaigns, which certainly Senator Campbell knows something about, you really endanger our very, very basic democracy. Yes, I, I do support campaign finance reform and transparency requirements. All right. Let's talk about deficit reduction. The National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform has recommended a $4 trillion deficit reduction target. What is your target? Which areas of the budget, if any, would you exempt from deficit reduction efforts? Mr. Baumgartner, start with you. Yeah, well, thank you. As I said earlier, you know, I think we would be far better off uh, to have voted and passed the Bull Simpson uh, Commission plan than what Senator Cantwell has done, which is three years of not even passing a budget, the epitome of continuing to kick the can down the road, and no real plan for the reforms or potentially even the tax increases that uh, our economy is going to need. Uh, I would like to see a balanced budget amendment or something as close as that we can get to that. Uh, in the state Senate, in the state legislature, we have a balanced budget requirement. And what that does is it forces us to have a greater degree of fiscal responsibility, but it also forces Republicans and Democrats to work together. We have to prioritize, and then people can decide uh, who they want to uh, vote for or not based on how that prioritization is gone. If we could get anywhere near the productivity uh, back in Washington, D.C., that we've gotten in our state legislature the past two years, I think our country would be a heck of a lot better off, and that's something I'll be working towards. 
Right. Senator Cantwell? Your question was very important, and I think it's illuminating because when it boils down to it, I think this race and many races are about this, how we're going to move our country forward, and are we going to try to balance it on the backs of seniors? You have my commitment. I'm not going to do that. In fact, one of the complaints I had about Simpson Bowles was the fact that they wanted to start off right away with basically having a cut to Social Security. I asked myself, with all the things that have happened to our economy, the implosion of Wall Street, all the things that have gone wrong, the fact that small businesses couldn't get capital, and somehow it was seniors and Social Security that had cooked up financial instruments and thrust them on our economy, I don't think so, and yet that was their recommendation to cut Social Security right away. Social Security is valid until 2033, and we can talk about ways to improve it and strengthen it, but I'm going to fight to protect it. As far as the $4 trillion is concerned, as I said, I definitely want to recoup some of the, benef the money that was paid out to Wall Street. I do support the President's level of going up to a million dollars and saying we should let the Bush tax cuts expire. Even Grover Norquist says leaving the tax cut to expire isn't a tax increase. And if that's what Grover Norquist thinks, my gosh, we should be able to get that done and put some money back into our economy. So when we get back, we need to make sure that we don't go over the fiscal cliff. But you won't find me standing in the aisle saying that I will vote to cut Thanks. Social Security. Right. Uh, Syrian President Bashar al-Assad remains in power as civil conflict rages there. Meanwhile, rhetoric from the Iranian government is escalating as they hint at the prospect of open conflict with Israel. What is your approach to these two situations? What role should the U.S. take, first with regards to Syria, second towards Iran, and lastly, towards the Middle East in general? Senator Cantwell. Well, that's a very good uh, question, Kim. And for Syria, it is a very complex situation. And so the notion that the United States could get directly involved right now is something I don't want to do. I do support humanitarian aid. I do support making sure that uh, the people on the ground have the ability to go to Turkey and go to various places for safety. But there is the key thing for us right now is to continue to put pressure on uh, China and Russia and others to get the Assad a regime out of power and to back down. They cannot continue to attack their people. The reason I say this is about the larger world community is because I've worked so hard in Iran to make sure that in this case we used economic sanctions. I passed a bipartisan sanction piece of legislation with Lisa Murkowski from Alaska that is now being put in place that basically puts pressure on China and other people to have transparency on how Iran gets oil refined. The reason that's so important is because it is a huge percentage of their revenues. So I believe we're starting to see Iran change because of that pressure on their economy, and I hope that that kind of action will bring them to the table as opposed to someone thinking that we're flying into Iran tomorrow. And Mr. Baumgartner. Well, I'm glad you asked this question because, you know, this election shouldn't be so much about Senator Cantwell's past failures about voting to put two wars on a credit card. It should be about how she might vote for the next one. You know, and I had the great privilege of going to Syria as a Kerr scholar from the National Council on U.S. Arab Relations when I was in high school. I was one of 10 Americans sent there to spend the summer. I had a great time, and I, had, I loved those people, and I had a great time there. We absolutely should not intervene there. It is not in our natural, national interest uh, unless they start doing things with their chemical weapons, and we think those are going to fall into the wrong hands. Then we should take action. With regard to Iran, it is absolutely a absolutely dangerous thing for Iran to get nuclear weapons. It would like to lead to the rest of the region going nuclear, and that will be a tremendous security threat. But the last thing we need right now is another poorly planned war, and we don't need senators to authorize poorly planned wars without clear exit strategies like Senator Cantwell has done repeatedly. So we need to know what would happen the day after the day after and what the Hezbollah ter terror cells would be likely to do here in America if action was taken. Right now we don't have any credibility in the Middle East because of our failed foreign policy. By withdrawing from Afghanistan, we'd have more leverage, and we need to develop a strategy that better uses moderate Muslims on the ground to deal with these issues. I think this is something in the key job description. This is a job description. Uh, job application process at the end of the day, where I would really provide a lot of value in the U.S. Senate. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, investments in education for children represent less than 8 percent of federal spending, yet children make up a full quarter of our population. 
sequestration, which we mentioned, which uh, will cut deeply into education funding, more than $6 billion. So what do you think is the role of the federal government in ensuring quality education for all children, and especially early learning? Mr. Baumgartner. Well, early learning is so important. You know, I, I, I certainly have frequent discussions with, with my mother, who is one of Washington State's uh, first board certified uh, kindergarten teachers about the importance of what goes on before uh, kids get into her classroom. It's something we need to continue to fund. And every time you talk about sequestration, I hope everybody at home thinks about Senator Cantwell's negligence on trying to have a balanced budget and her negligence on kicking the can down the road and her negligence is actually solving this. So there's no better example of what's gone wrong than this debt super committee and the sequestration. Uh, the federal government should set high standards and should test. But I like the idea of more local control and decision making for how we uh, support our education. And I also like the idea of federal dollars following the student. So I'd like to see more flexibility in federal dollars for states to choose things and parents to be able to choose things for them. Uh, unlike Senator Cantwell, I'm someone who supports public charter schools and supports innovation. Uh, and I'm not someone who would just be a tool of the teachers union uh, in the U.S. Senate. All right. Senator Cantwell. Well, education is so important. As somebody who went to school on financial aid and got to be the first person in my family to graduate from college, I know how important this is. But Enrique, your question started with early childhood education. And that's why I want to make sure that we don't have a Ryan budget that basically would cut some of our most essential education programs. I want to make sure that we invest in early childhood education. And then in the K through 12 system, I have been focused to make sure that we continue science, technology, engineering, and math. Some of the best advancements I've seen in our state have been at the Mead School District in Spokane, or Delta High School in the Tri-Cities, or in Evergreen School District in Southwest Washington, or in Highline, the Aviation High School. They are reinventing the way education works. They are getting a new generation of young students to care passionately about those key sectors that we need to have skilled workers in. So I'm going to keep pushing for that innovation, but I am not going to support ideas like the Ryan budget, which my opponent does, that would cut Pell Grant education. We need more people going to four-year degrees. We need two-year degrees as well, but we need to make college more affordable, and I think this is a key difference. All right. So Mitt Romney says he likes Big Bird, but he'd fire him. Jim Lehrer, too. According to Mr. Romney, federal funding for public broadcasting is an ex expense we can live without. Critics say it misses the point because funding for public broadcasting is so small, it has such a large return on investment in terms of education. Tell us now, as you are being watched and listened to on public television and radio stations across the region, where do you stand on funding for public broadcasting? Is it a waste or is it worth it? Senator Campbell. No pressure on this one. No, it's... <laughs> You know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this um, is because of what public television represents and the fact that this is going to be broadcast many times, not one night, but many, many times between now and the election. We like that about public broadcasting. And, uh, you know, I should take a, an opportunity. My mom's here tonight, and uh, I know she's grimacing a little bit because it's probably hard to hear all this stuff when, you're, when your daughter's being attacked. But, Mom, I know how to stick up for myself, okay? <laughs> and, you know... She and I had the most wonderful experience. Uh, we came down because of public broadcast and KCTS uh, to hear the Irish tenors. And uh, we just had a wonderful time. She's a singer. She sings in the Edmonds uh, music group and has a wonderful voice. And because public television brought those unique people into our living room, we also got to come down here and listen to them as they performed. That's what it is. It's bringing things to the public that they might not necessarily get to see on their own. And so I really appreciate that about public television. Mr. Baumgartner. Yeah, well, thank you. Well, I'm a, a big fan of Big Bird and a big fan of public television. Uh, my wife and I actually, you know, as a state center, you don't make a tremendous amount of money. You make a good salary, you make $40,000 a year. Uh, but when you're trying to raise two kids and you're looking to buy a house and you're trying to do those middle class things like save for your kid's college, you know, you have to do a little belt tightening sometimes. So we actually drop cable uh, and get over the air. And so we watch a lot of PBS. And uh, my wife, being English, is, is a particular fan of some of the programs that run on PBS. And I really, really like Frontline. Uh, I think it does some of the best coverage of Afghanistan. And in fact, you know, I was just talking when I was at, at uh, uh, Fort Polk 
couple days ago, I was talking about Frontline with a couple of these captains who both deployed and were going to go back, and we were talking about those issues. And I do want to mention that when I was talking to those captains, when you think about what's gone on with Senator Cantwell's wars, of these two captains I went to lunch with, they told me about of their group of 12 captains, nine of them, nine, are getting treatment for PTSD right now. And you think about the cost of these wars and the idea of putting them on a credit card and the human toll they are taking. The suicide rates are real. The divorce rates are real. The PTSD rates are real. And we have more challenges coming from the Middle East. So it's one thing for Senator Cantwell to look at my proposed gas tax and say, hey, I don't like it. But at least it's an effort to pay for the wars, an effort to provide veterans care, and an effort to take our population. A lot of things have gone on in these wars, but the country has not gone to war. The country has not gone to war. And we need something to remind the American people that we still have 70,000 troops getting Thank shot you. at Thank the you. desert right now. Thanks, Mr. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. I'd like to ask both of you to address, uh, address an issue about tribal gaming in the Spokane area. The Spokane tribe has proposed building a third casino at an off-reservation site in the Airway Heights area outside of Spokane. And to do so, the tribe needs to be granted an exception uh, of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act that generally prohibits uh, tribal gaming on lands acquired after 1988. Now, supporters say this is going to create jobs, those that want the casino built. Opponents of the project say that it would violate the spirit of the act and potentially open up the expansion of gaming in other cities. Where do you stand on this proposed casino by the uh, Spokane tribe, Mr. Baumgartner? <clears throat> well, I know this issue well because it's in my uh, home district, and I oppose the expansion uh, of this casino, uh, the building of this casino. Uh, one of the things that is very important about this issue is it's right next to Fairchild Air Force Base, which is tremendously important for the national security of America, but also tremendously important for the economy of eastern Washington. And this proposed uh, casino uh, would put that in doubt. Uh, I do have to say that in general with, the, with Native uh, American issues and with casinos, I think America has made a lot of progress in, in recent years in providing ability for economic development on our Native American Indian reservations. Uh, when I was a boy, I had the great privilege of playing with basketball with the Nez Perce down at Lapway. Uh, I was almost the only non-Native American on our team, and we uh, twice won the AAU basketball championships in Yakima and went to nationals. And I thought at a young age, being different than everybody else uh, in a competitive environment like that really helped my formation and led me uh, to want to go out and learn more about other cultures. And so I think you would find me as someone who has great sympathy and a desire to have great understanding of those issues, but I don't think this casino is the right maneuver uh, in the, uh, that area of our Washington right now. Senator Cantwell. Well, I've been very concerned that as Indian gaming is increased across America, that we don't have something called reservation shopping. That's why we've supported stronger rules in making sure that these things are outlined. So this tribe will have to go, like other, every other one, through a process and procedure. I have no idea whether they meet the requirements or not, but it's very important that they follow a process and that the community and everybody around them have a say. I know there's concerns about uh, Fairchild. There's concerns from other business interests, and that's what a regional process is, and I hope to make sure that that process goes well. But I'd like to go back to something. Senator Baumgartner's wrong. All of America did go to war in Iraq and Afghanistan. We support our troops. We support those brave men and women who have served our country, and we thank them. And that's why I'm working so hard when they come home to make sure that they have jobs. But what is wrong is the notion that we think we can't support them. My opponent said at the Everett Herald Ed Board that he wouldn't have voted he, for going to Afghanistan, but then when it came time to voting for the funds for Afghanistan, he said he wouldn't support that. That support was about standing up the Afghan army so that we can come home and Afghanistan can take charge of their own responsibilities. Uh, the last coal-fired plant uh, in the state is being shut down, as we heard earlier in the debate, and converted to natural gas. Yet plans are also underway to build up to five coal terminals in the northwest to feed Asia's voracious coal appetite. This seems like a contradiction. It's not okay to use coal ourselves, but it's okay to sell it. Uh, and it ignores the reality that coal burned in China affects the planet just as much as coal burned here. Where do you stand on the proposed coal terminals in the Northwest, and how do you view this apparent contradiction? Senator Cantwell. Well, as I said earlier, I want us to get off of fossil fuels and diversify. 
I think it would be better for the United States to be pursuing a policy of clean energy with China. We have some things that we can work on together that will actually mean jobs for Northwest companies to sell clean energy solutions to China. We already ship them airplanes and sell them software and sell them coffee, and working together on clean energy solutions would be a great idea. So I'm going to make sure that as this proposal moves forward around various communities in our state, that we are going to make sure that questions are asked about the mitigation, the impact of these coal facilities. During that process, I hope that we will come up with the answers. If we don't, I'm not sure that coal in and of itself should be the focus of moving forward. But I do want to emphasize how much it is important and imperative that we continue to build infrastructure for the U.S. to ship products to China specifically. So it may be that these terminals, that these rail lines, that this improved infrastructure would help us in having a quicker, faster railway to sell other products in the future. And Mr. Baumgartner. <clears throat> well, I have a, a lot of concern uh, about the coal trains, uh, not least of which is because the line that would split uh, in my home district. And uh, we need to know what are the impacts of this. And we need to know what are going to be the comprehensive impacts. Is it going to impact emergency response if we have more trains coming across and people can't get across the train line? What's going to happen with the coal dust? Is it going to have impacts uh, on our health care? So I want to see a thorough review of all of that and a clear understanding of that. You know, but I would say that those that uh, are against the coal trains purely because of the issue of the carbon going to the atmosphere, uh, China is going to burn coal whether we like it or not. And that's just a fact of life. And so if you don't want the Chinese to do that, you know, I would again recommend you send a, a former diplomat uh, to the Senate uh, to work on those kind of issues. But I think we have to realize what the Chinese are going to do. I certainly approve of the idea of greater energy independence here in America, which is going to require uh, a all-of-the-above approach, and it's going to require more uh, development of natural resources here. That is connected to getting our troops out of the Middle East, making us less dependent on wars and foreign dictators overseas, and very uh, connected to our economy and trying to balance that debt to leave a better America for our future. So I think natural resources are one of the things that has to be developed here in America. It's been reported that a common practice among local law enforcement agencies in many counties in Washington state is to call the U.S. Border Patrol when a person is pulled over and can only speak Spanish. Immigrant rights groups say that the Border Patrol agents don't just provide interpretation, but they often question and then they arrest people who they find are here without documentation. They say such actions by the Border Patrol uh, is often uh, racial profiling. And it raises serious concerns about violations of the Federal Civil Rights Act. Now, should this common practice continue, and should this be the role of the U.S. Border Patrol, Mr. Baumgartner? Well, I'd say the first thing we ought to do is uh, teach more of our law enforcement officers Spanish uh, so they could communicate directly. I think everybody should learn uh, multiple languages in our interconnected global economy. Uh, you know, my French isn't as good as it used to be, uh, but I do enjoy speaking it. And uh, one of the reasons I met my wife in Afghanistan is because she had learned to speak Dari, and that's how she got down to, to Helmand Province. You know, our immigration system in America needs a lot of work. Again, it's been one of the failures of Washington, D.C. for these 12 years because rather than solve it, it's been more opportunistic for some folks to use it as a wedge issue uh, in election years. Uh, that certainly is the case uh, with this issue. So, you know, our border patrols need to, our border needs to be secure, but they shouldn't be uh, seeking to deal with petty criminals here. That's something law enforcement should do directly. All right. Senator Cantwell. This is a very important issue about balancing privacy rights and security issues. We all know the Rassam case of when a terrorist tried to come over the Canadian border into our state, and it was good Border Patrol security that actually stopped him. Now, what we need to do, though, is make sure that around our borders, and we've had problems in uh, Port Angeles, we've had problems even in Skagit County, of people stopping and pulling individuals over when they don't even know uh, what agencies or organizations they represent. So I intervened on the peninsula to make sure that local law enforcement was working with border agents and establishing a regime to make sure that the local government was taking the lead. 
This is an important issue. We want the privacy rights of individuals in the Northwest to be respected. We want their civil rights to be respected. But we also want to have good border security. And so I think having local law enforcement play a key role here in communicating with the Border Control is very, very important. And we'll continue to make sure that that is done. All right, that was our final question. We're going to move now to closing statements. The order was determined in advance, and we begin with Senator Cantwell. Well, thank you very much, and thanks again to KTCS and to my opponent and to everyone here. Um, I also want to I thank my nephew who's here. Thank you very much. Well, actually, two nephews who are here, uh, one from out of town. And, um, you know, this election, as I said, um, my nephew's looking for a job. And it reminds me how much jobs in the economy are what's important here. So that's why I worked hard to help the fishing industry by coming up with a new process and help create fishing jobs. I wanted to make sure that the shipbuilding industry got a boost and that more jobs were created. I focused on aviation. And as the chair of the Aviation Committee, you bet I'm going to focus on making sure we remain the hub of the aerospace industry. We passed good bipartisan legislation to make sure that we invested in jobs in construction and in other infrastructure. This election is about whether we are going to continue to move forward on the types of job creation that our nation needs or whether we're going to try to balance this budget on the backs of our seniors. I'm not going to do that. I'm not for the Ryan plan. I'm not for gutting Social Security or the safety net. I know if we invest in the American worker, our economy will be strong. And just like 50 years ago today, when we opened the Space Needle, we can have an era of optimism and opportunity. But it's an investment in science and technology that's going to get us there, and not the policies of a Tea Party that want to filibuster more of Congress. I'm asking for your support. I will continue to work hard from Spokane in the north-south quarter that we got done to southwest Washington in the port improvements there and in various parts of our state. I'm asking for your help to fight for these policies in Washington, D.C., and make sure we get the job done. All right, Mr. Baumgartner. Well, thank you. I want to uh, thank the moderators. I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting this together, and, and thank you, Senator Cantwell, uh, for being here. I certainly wish we could do more. You know, and uh, I think it's been a disservice to the voters of this state. We haven't had the opportunity for more debates, but I've appreciated this, uh, this opportunity here. Campaigns shouldn't be about who's got the most money or who wears what particular political hat. You know, the crisis in America right now is too important. They should be who has the best ideas and solutions. You know, I think you have a very clear idea of what you're going to get from Senator Cantwell if you send her back. You're going to get a lot, of, a lot of what you had the last 12 years. And this is a time for remarkable leadership. And I think if Senator Cantwell had the ability or the willingness to do something remarkable, I think he would have seen it in those last 12 years. You know, I've traveled all around uh, this great uh, Mother Earth of ours in this great country, and I know that America is absolutely exceptional. Doesn't mean we don't have things to improve on. Doesn't mean we can't learn things from other countries. But we're so exceptional. And one of the reasons is is because we always leave things better in America for the next generation that comes. Well, that's not happening right now. All this debt, all this partisanship, this stagnant economy, these wars that haven't been funded, this lack of a smarter foreign policy in the Middle East. And I don't want to see that happen. So with your help, with your vote, you're getting somebody that will strongly speak his mind, strongly be a voice of independent leadership. It won't be about whether I'm a Republican. It'll be, it won't be about whether I'm a Democrat. It'll be about doing what's right. I think together... We can solve this challenge. We can solve this debt crisis while, by real ideas, not just platitudes. And I think if we do that, we will continue what to do, be what makes America so exceptional. We'll leave a better America, not just for my Conrad or for my Roman, but for your children and grandchildren as well. I'm Michael Baumgartner. I thank you all for being here. And I'm asking for your vote for U.S. Senate. And we thank you both for being here. And that's all the time that we have for this debate. You can get more information about this and other important races by going to kcts9.org slash vote 2012. There are videos, maps, and links to election resources, including the League of Women Voters and Vote 411. 
And I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters of Washington, Kim Abel, for partnering with KCTS 9 for this series. Thanks to our studio audience and thanks to the candidates who joined us today. Let's please give them another round of applause. And thank you at home for joining us. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Local production and broadcast of this program is made possible by the Floyd and Dolores Jones Foundation and by viewers like you. Thank you.